Um, so uh, Howie runs an incredible company uh, called Airtable. It's a way to make a better spreadsheet. They've just raised uh, over $50 million for a total of $62.6 .6 million raised, changing how uh, the simple spreadsheet uh, work functions in the office. Clients like BuzzFeed, major media companies, major technology companies. Uh, and before that, he was one of the few early batches of YC uh, where after getting his uh, first company funded by Ashton Kutcher, sold it in under a year after uh, that funding. Um, really special dude. Please join me in giving him a huge round of applause. Thanks. Great. Well, that's how we start. How will we end? Total overkill. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How are you feeling today? Good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you for asking. Um, so one of the things I really like to do at these events is um, to show just not just myself, but everybody here, that uh, we're all human. And so one of the best ways to do that is to talk about where all this started for you. Uh, tell us about your childhood growing up. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, generally speaking, I was a pretty rambunctious kid. Um, you know, was very uh, sort of impatient. And uh, I think at one point, um, the, uh, my parents told me they, uh, that the doctor wanted to, to prescribe me Ritalin, um, which, uh, which they actually ended up, uh, you know, declining. But uh, was very, uh, you know, very much a context switcher, always looking for uh, kind of new uh, things to, to play with in terms of toys or, or new things to learn about, um, and you know, loved things like nature camp and, and doing uh, outdoors, you know, Boy Scouts type stuff growing up. Cool. Yeah, and then. You know, we'll get into sort of the early influences of entrepreneurship, but uh, what were your parents like? What would you say the values that they um, uh, sort of passed down onto you were in those early days? Yeah, I mean, and I'll preface by saying I think um, you know generally as a you know as a Silicon Valley culture, we tend to over patternize on you know kind of people's backgrounds and, and parents, and so I think it's important to emphasize that you know my opinion is that you know talent and, and entrepreneurial talent certainly is uh, distributed, and that you know it doesn't really uh, you know you don't have to be beholden to you know what what your background was or, or you know how your parents instilled in your certain values or not values. Um, in my case, I mean, I think um, you know generally speaking, uh, parents. Let me have a pretty long leash in, in terms of uh, exploring with with you know kind of physical activity as well as uh, you know the, the academic ones, um, and I feel like I really had uh, you know the, the fortune of of being able to uh, just kind of poke around and, and learn things on my own. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of funny. What was your first dream job? You know, in the early days. Yeah, I mean, when I was a really small kid, uh, I think in third grade, I became obsessed with uh, insects, and uh, there, I think that the term, if I remember correctly, is a myrmecologist was a studier of ants. So I had, a, I think, our school we had ant farms, and I had my own little ant farm. I was really interested in learning about ant colonies and, and their patterns and stuff. Um, I think that that uh, that's no longer a top interest we can say um, safely for for me vocationally. Uh, but yeah, I think that you know, kind of early. Early, early interest was really around like animals and biology and uh, you know potentially paleontology because I think Jurassic Park was still fresh on the mind at the time. Yeah, and I think you bring up a really good point that I think we do sort of over patternize um, some of the sort of originating uh, stories. Um, but I wonder, you know, in your eventual rise to entrepreneurship, did you feel like you had any edge um, that you know maybe isn't common amongst those who have talents that are perhaps more distributed? You know, I think um, you know I think. Every entrepreneur brings to the table their own unique edges, you know, and, and facets. Um, in my case, I think, uh, you know, probably, you know, it, the the biggest, uh, you know, sort of attribute I think I had was was just an open-minded, uh, you know, sort of nature and and kind of a willingness to to learn, you know, whatever it took or, or new things in general. So I don't know if I had a, a specific disciplinary edge. I mean, certainly during college, I think, uh, you know, studying public policy was actually a really really great mm -hmm. um, foray into uh, learning how. How to structure thoughts in a very coherent mm -hmm. and concise way. Um, I think writing generally um, has been a really useful skill set to have uh, in terms of tangibles, but yeah. Why did you choose public <clears throat> policy? I think at the time, um, and to this day, I you know I was very fascinated with um, you know kind of systems of, of government and, and law. Um, I think law is, is still pretty fascinating to me, um, mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of understanding how you know a lot of these uh, court cases that that you know kind of decided on such uh, you know kind of things of, of great import, right? I mean, all the Supreme Court decisions, um, all of the stuff in IP law, you know, corporate law, etc. Um, you know, uh, so so I think like law in general has been pretty 
pretty interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then public policy in particular, I think just, you know, at the time, uh, certainly entering into college, I think I was really interested in, in just kind of how government systems worked. Mm -hmm. So how does someone studying government systems decide to launch a um contacts management and uh, sort of information gathering company. Yeah, well, I mean, I think by, by the time I exited college, most of those interests had kind of gone <laughs> completely out the window. Um, ironically, because this was 08 and, well, 09 was when I graduated, but kind of around the 08, yeah. uh, you know, kind of crisis, obviously a lot of tech was um, sort of dissipating, or at least it seemed like it was. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you remember, but there was the infamous uh, Sequoia, you know, PowerPoint deck that was leaked out to TechCrunch or mm -hmm. something that had an RIP Good Times Tombstone, mm. um, you know, as the the kind of front, uh, you know, kind of image. Um, so kind of a uh, you know a, a bizarre and and perhaps uh, unexpected time um, for me to to get really excited about tech and startups. But um, you know, it, it couldn't control the timing, and so was just really really fascinated by um, a lot of the innovation happening, and and uh, you know, loved reading about the new uh, interesting companies being launched. It seemed like you know, kind of on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So you're studying this, reading about it, um, sort of political background. How does somebody with that background then transition into technology? You know, I think there are a lot of folks in the room who maybe come from non-traditional backgrounds to get into tech. I think that's something I think we all have in common. How does one make that initial foray? How do you break in? Yeah, I think uh, you know from what I've seen and in my own personal experience, I think um, you know there, there's no one path. In my mm -hmm. case, uh, you know it was a lot of sweat in, in on nights and weekends. Um, you know, a putting in. Uh, you know, kind of a lot of time and energy into learning about uh, web products and kind of following a lot of the, the different companies and trying to, to kind of think about, you know, uh, what made some of these products great and not others and, um, you know, what are some of the interesting areas for innovation. Um, also, very specifically, uh, you know, throughout college, even though I didn't major in computer science, um, ended up just kind of uh, trying to teach myself how to program. Um, so a lot of like kind of late nights, uh, you know, kind of not, uh, not necessarily going out and, and uh, kind of partaking in, in uh, partying like a lot of the rest of the crowd, but uh, just kind of learning uh, PHP at the time and, and JavaScript and all that stuff. Um. Cool. So those skills came in handy when you began building eTacts, mm -hmm. right? Tell us about that story. What is this company? Um, and what was it when you first ideated on it, and what did it sort of become over time? Yeah, so the, the vision of Etax was really to make CRM um, a very, uh, you know, kind of automated and intelligent experience. So generally speaking, um, certainly at that time, you know, if you use Salesforce or even some of the, the kind of, uh, you know, more user-friendly products out there, um, you know, they were just basically a database where you put data in, and, you know, that's kind of what you get out. And they were kind of very structured to do a, a certain kind of uh, relationship relationship management or even like sales transactional management. Um, and uh, at the time, I was really fascinated by kind of the, the opportunity to perhaps reimagine that uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to have worked at a, a different company for a brief uh, stint as a, basically a, a mix of sales engineering and business development. Mm -hmm. It was a four-person company, so everybody worked uh, on a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, had a chance to kind of experience some of the CRMs firsthand through that. And, uh, and so really coming out of that, wanted to, to basically reimagine that experience to be um, a lot more kind of modern and intelligent. And so uh, started building the product um, and the, the V1 was basically to, to create a CRM that would automatically pull in your emails and your phone calls, um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, you know, kind of graph and show you a, an evergreen dashboard of all the people you had or hadn't talked to. You know, this person, uh, I want to set a three month reminder on and if I don't talk to them every three months, then remind me. It could be, um, you know, kind of a work relationship that you want to maintain. Uh, could be a personal friend. Um, so very, uh, you know, kind of very much intended to be a um, initially a, a prosumer oriented mm -hmm. product with an intent of going down the uh, the business and, and teams use cases. Yeah, and that's a product where I think you know you were so embedded in it, you got a chance to see some of the problems head first. Um, but how do you know that you now know enough to start that company? You know, maybe some folks here are in sort of slow lumbering corporations and they see that there are some things they could fix. Uh, how do you pick out that problem and decide I'm going to build this? And how do you know you've built enough to ship it? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and this is where there's a stark contrast between that experience with eTacts and, and subsequently my experience in founding Airtable. Um, with eTacts, I mean, we didn't really know is the, the short answer. So um, I think, uh, you know, there there was literally a, a moment where, um, you know, I was, I think nights and weekends, I was already starting to, to kind of do some research on the space, see if there were any other products that were kind of doing similar things, um, you know, even vaguely related, uh, you know, kind of contact management tools. Plaxo was one that, um, for instance, I, I 
checked mm -hmm. out, uh, which was an early precursor to um, some of the social networks today. Um, and uh, you know, I don't think there was a, a specific moment where I had this kind of moment of truth where I mm -hmm. felt 100% certainty in it. And there was a lot, always a lot of uncertainty, and I think uh, we were basically just kind of trying to scramble as quickly as we could to get to the next milestone mm -hmm. of validation. Mm -hmm. So I mean, really, it was the the fortune of kind of early on having you know kind of had this the seed of an idea, um, and then being able to literally just kind of build out a prototype nights and weekends, and then mm -hmm. eventually, I think for for kind of a, a few week time span um, where uh, I and my co-founder of that company had taken off from, from uh, our jobs and, and kind of uh, you know, worked full time on that product using the, the limited and, and uh, decreasing savings that we had saved up. Um, but uh, you know, like, you know, and to, to get to the point where we had uh, a prototype that we could, for instance, submit mm -hmm. to Y Combinator and um, in that particular case, like we were lucky enough to, mm -hmm. to get through that process and get in. And so mm -hmm. honestly, uh, it was very much you know, just kind of what is the next immediate mm -hmm. milestone that we can get to to survive and, and see another day, right? Yeah, that survival mindset, I think, uh, especially applies to the first company. I think we'll do a little more of a comparison soon. And I definitely want to lean into the Y Combinator story. But first, um, how did you know that it was time to quit and work on this thing? I think yeah. there's a lot of folks here who have side hustles too. How do you know it's time to pull the trigger? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a pretty scary decision. Um, I didn't have, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of savings or a buffer to to really, uh, you know, take that decision very lightly. So mm -hmm. um, it was a, a huge kind of existential risk um, in my mind to to go and make that leap. Um, and honestly, I think one of the big factors was, you know, basically not uh, having to make that decision until after I'd already made some progress on it. Um, again, nights and weekends, and, and kind of uh, both from a Search standpoint, talking to a lot of people um, for feedback, and then also starting to prototype things. So, um, you know, I think uh, obviously there, there's a limitation to, to how many hours in the day that you can expend on that, and um, and it's extremely exhausting. Um, you know, but uh, you know, I think that that definitely helped. I think beyond that, there there was definitely. Um, I think just some amount of gut instinct around the the feeling, and uh, you know, at, at, certainly at the time, I think we we were extremely uncertain um, about the decision. But uh, but I guess we we had enough gut feel to, to kind of make that leap and, and take the risk. And you know, uh, at the time, I think I could have very easily foresaw uh, you know foreseen a you know alternate universe where it didn't work out, and, and sort of you know uh, you know we had to come you know kind of crawling back with our tail between our legs and figure out um, you know kind of what to do about our, our jobs and careers. Yeah, but I think, you know, especially, um, I think back to this era, it wouldn't have been so hard to get a job again. I think it would have been very hard to um, take the opportunity, right? You did the harder thing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, certainly, uh, you know, I was super fortunate in terms of my personal situation where, you know, for instance, uh, at the time didn't have, uh, you know, kind of too many financial or personal mm -hmm. life commitments. Um, and I think that's a huge luxury that, uh, you know, I, I recognize is not, you know, kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not something that we should take for granted. Um, so, you know, I think the, there, you know, frankly, um, you know, there, there are kind of points in time where it's easier for some people that it's going to be easier. And mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, there, there's not much of a uh, kind of a systemic uh, yeah. kind of answer. Sure. And so you apply to YC and mm -hmm. you're successful. What was the company like going in? And what did you learn along the way? What was the company that came out? Yeah, well, the company going in was two people, and it was two people coming out. Um, so in that sense, it stayed exactly <laughs> ah, the same. No change. Uh, right, right, exactly. Um, at the, so at, this was at a time when YC was actually a little bit smaller. Um, it had 2010? more. Uh, 2010, yeah. correct. Um, and uh, I think there were maybe 15 total companies in our batch with mm -hmm. a grand total of like, call it, you know, 30-ish people, um, maybe less uh, in the batch. Uh, we were one batch after Airbnb uh, went through YC, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I think really you know it was a whirlwind of you know ten weeks of basically trying to get to that next milestone. Mm -hmm. So initially you know kind of coming in with a prototype and the semblance of an idea and, and some uh, you know some vague. Um, notion of the market opportunity, um, and then furiously going out and trying to build out enough of the product to where we could launch it and actually get people to use it, uh, which we were successful in, in kind of doing in that 10 weeks, um, mm -hmm. then leveraging that to go and uh, and basically get some news coverage um, at the time, like sort of getting a tech crunch or a Mashable mm -hmm. article or, or kind of the, the end all be alls for, for us at that phase. And mm -hmm. um, we were lucky enough to, to be able to get those uh, you know kind of early pieces of press coverage that kind of helped beget more, more success and, and more traction. 
um, and then eventually culminating in by the end of YC, uh, which is still the case today um, for, for YC, you know, kind of converging on this demo day where all these investors convene um, in one fairly efficient kind of process where you can just kind of do a one-to-many pitch um, and, then, uh, and then see if anybody wants to invest. So um, I think really it, it took us from kind of being an idea and at best a prototype to then you know, be able to, to kind of in a very compressed timeline go and, and actually build out you know, what seemed like the beginning of a, a real company. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the folks in the audience might be thinking about what it is that you signaled, what kind of metrics you had, what um, you know, check uh, boxes you had checked off to be able to, to be successful in raising that seed or that mm -hmm. A round. Um, when you think about sort of what it was you pitched, if you can sort of go back to that, what are some of the metrics or the growth trajectories that you highlighted mm -hmm. to be able to successfully close funding? Right. Uh, so up and to the right is always good, um, and uh, but I think um, you know. So truth, you know, I think uh, the reality is that uh, in my personal experience, um, every investor looks for different things, and and they should um, because you know, kind of the uh, the right partnership with the right investor is really about finding um, kind of a mutual interest or a mutual kind of conviction in a space or opportunity that maybe the rest of the market doesn't necessarily believe in. I mean, I think by definition, um, in order to succeed in an, you know, kind of a free market environment, um, you have to have some kind of edge or some kind of belief that uh, you know, isn't necessarily obvious to the, the rest of the world. And so mm -hmm. um, to some extent, I think part of it is like expecting and, and being comfortable with failure in terms of going out and pitching investors. I mean, you don't need every investor to say yes to you. You just need one or however many is necessary to accumulate mm -hmm. the, the kind of round size you're looking for. Um, so that's the first one. Mm -hmm. I think the second part, I mean, generally, um, you know, YC teaches you and, and certainly did it at that time, a lot of the, the tactics of how to run an efficient fundraising process. So um, I think there, there's probably many blog posts at this point that kind of have, uh, you know, kind of publicized what, what those tactics are. So I won't go into too much depth about that, but I think high level, um, you know, a, a more general uh, kind of important uh, aspect of that is, you know, be able to paint this picture of a large potential market opportunity. So, you know, kind of uh, if the total upside is, you know, very limited and, and at most this can be a company that's you know X million dollars instead of X tens or hundreds or billions uh, of of millions of uh, dollars. Um, then you know of course it's it's easier uh, you know it's easier to get investors excited about the bigger market opportunity, the bigger upside, um, and certainly more so if, if they're uh, you know kind of institutional investors or investors who are looking for like kind of the, the really big returns. Um, I think, uh, and then on that note, it's easier said than done, uh, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can actually kind of see beyond the initial product offering and kind of, uh, you know, kind of see how, how your product um, and articulate how your product can grow beyond that initial form um, in order to go and, and capture a, a larger market opportunity. So, you know, uh, it's not necessarily this fixed static thing what your market opportunity is, but if you have the, the kind of vision and passion and, and kind of excitement around, uh, you know, what your product could become, then I think um, you can do a better job of, of kind of going out and articulating to investors uh, what that even bigger kind of, they squint their eyes and see the, <laughs> the massive, you know, kind of best case scenario, um, you know, kind of outcome for, for this investment, what that is. Yeah, the healthy optimism is a good one. And uh, there's a great story about uh, your first investor um, right at Demo Day. And I wonder if you'd want to talk about uh, meeting Ashton and how that deal actually went down. Yeah, well, so, um, you know, he was one of, uh, you know, many investors that yeah. participated in our seed round. Um, I think this was actually the first year that he started uh, attending Y Combinator's yeah. Demo Day. So, I mean, frankly, um, we didn't really do anything special uh, to, to make that happen other than go up and pitch like the other companies. And we were fortunate enough that, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, was, was interested in, in kind of chatting further about our particular pitch and, and company, and um, you know, I think he is an extremely savvy, extremely sharp uh, tech investor that um, holds his own or better against any of the other top tech investors. So in that sense, um, the pitching process was you know pretty much the same as as we would uh, you know have faced with any other you know kind of great uh, venture investor. Um, with the difference being, obviously, you know, it's you, you get really nervous when you're talking mm -hmm. to uh, a big time celebrity, um, mm -hmm. you know, who's also really, really uh, actually a very humble and, and kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a kind person to chat with. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, kind of a, a crazy and, and kind of unexpected experience um, for for two, you know, kind of recent college grads who really, you know, kind of didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but you know, definitely uh, something we're, we're really fortunate to have um, been a part of. Yeah, is it is it true, or is it maybe a little bit hyperbole that you guys pitched on the set of Two and a Half Men? So that was true for Airtable. Um, yeah, yeah. So subsequently, uh, when uh, when I founded Airtable and, and and went off and uh, you know kind of ran the initial kind of fundraising process, and we mostly only um, you know kind of uh, t you know t took investment meetings from people we had prior relationships to or had you know previously invested in uh, in uh, eTacts. Um, but yeah, it just so happened that as logistics worked out, you know Ashton was based in um, you know SoCal, uh, and uh, I think you know the the meeting uh, happened to be at a time slot where you know uh, we we had to go over to I think it was Burbank and uh, and actually go into the trailer that he was staying at. Um, <laughs> right after he came off the set of, uh, of Two and a Half Men. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we'll definitely dig into that story. I want to uh, wrap this story up by asking why you decided to sell. Uh, things seemed to be going well. You pitched a grand vision. Investors got behind that vision. And then you uh, decided to exit. Yeah, Tell I mean, I think the thought process, yeah. a few things. I mean, one is that um, at the time, I think, you know, it, as I mentioned before, eTax, unlike Airtable, was very much kind of, you know, while we had a fuzzy notion of what the bigger market opportunity could be, um, we were very much kind of optimizing for and kind of thinking about kind of the next one or two or maybe three chess moves ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it felt like uh, at every point there was a lot more to figure out and, and we didn't necessarily know how or whether we would figure out kind of what the next five phases of growth would look like. Um, so I think part of it was, you know, there was less certainty and confidence that we had in terms of what the alternative path would be in terms of execution. Right. Um, I think uh, you know separately there was also a uh, you know a recognition um, certainly on my part uh, that you know I had a lot more to learn and and that um, if I wanted to go and, and uh, actually work on a company that I believed in deeply enough to kind of dedicate potentially the rest of my life to and, and really make kind of a, a career long company um, and and kind of find uh, you know the, the right type of uh, vision and mission and, and kind of culture etc that um, that really could you know kind of uh, justify you dedicating that long of, of, a, of a commitment to um, that there was a lot more that I needed to learn in terms of both the, the startup you know an operational skill set but also just in terms of you know finding um, and deeply understanding a new market opportunity enough mm -hmm. to really have that amount of conviction so I think in the case of Salesforce acquiring us um, it actually ended up being a perfect alignment in terms of you know us uh, you know as the acquirees getting exposure to all of this invaluable um, you know kind of insight and, and uh, you know kind of understanding of the enterprise software Software market mm -hmm. and also just kind of of the cloud software market in general. So um, had a huge amount of respect um, and uh, had a huge amount, huge amount of uh, learning and mentorship from a lot of the, the folks at Salesforce um, who I had the fortune of, of working with and, and uh, learning from. Yeah, and uh, as you were there, you're learning about enterprise, learning about sales, you're learning about how the sort of machinery of a corporation works, uh, and you're also getting a lot of really cool exposure product. Um, I wonder, you know, this is a really cool learning environment. How did you know it was time to leave and start a new company when you're learning so much, getting paid fairly well, I'm assuming, and uh, in a pretty good environment? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was tough. It was um, a pretty qualitative threshold as with, uh, you know, kind of starting eTax in the first place. So there wasn't um, a specific discrete point at which uh, you know, it became immediately obvious that um, I wanted to leave, um, and it certainly wasn't uh, you know a function of just you know some some financial you know kind of payout structure or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a function of just kind of at some point um, you know if you're learning very quickly through osmosis and, and kind of absorption in a new environment, um, obviously there, there's kind of eventually diminishing marginal returns on that mm -hmm. learning, um, and then at the same time you know kind of my impatience perhaps uh, you know in, in terms of wanting to get started on uh, the next thing uh, was growing and growing and so I think at some point those lines roughly intersected and crossed over mm -hmm. and uh, you know um, it could have been you know easily could have been like another six months or six months less um, but you know it, it felt uh, like the right time for me yeah and I think one of the key points there uh, in your case maybe it was uh, sort of that um, gumption that impatience that helped you do this but there is you know a, a very known phenomenon of golden handcuffs um, you know, the salary is good. What is it that you might tell this crowd, some folks who are probably doing fairly well where they are, um, but might want to start something uh, that they should think about in order to actually make that final jump? 
Uh, sorry, and uh, can you clarify the yeah. golden handcuffs? Golden handcuffs um, uh, good salary so far as the... uh, or equity offering yeah. that makes them comfortable and uh, makes it difficult to leave where they are right now in order to pursue a dream that they may have had or been hustling on already for mm -hmm. a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's no one size fits all for, for everyone, and it's such a function of you know your personal situation and you know the the confidence uh, level that you have for any given uh, you know kind of uh, startup opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and and ultimately I think that's sort of a, a very very deeply intimate and personal decision that you know every single person has to wrestle uh, with on their own. I mean, I I do think um, you know generally speaking. Uh, you know, there is obviously a very finite uh, amount of time that we have to to work on a company or to like live at all. And so, um, you know, certainly for me, one of the the kind of uh, heuristics was just you know this this recognition that like there is a very finite window of time. Um, you know, whether that's from you know like birth to to kind of uh, you know end of life or uh, or you know kind of within a certain window where you know, uh, it's logistically feasible mm -hmm. um, to, to go out and, and do something. So I think uh, certainly for me, you know, kind of just being aware of, you know, uh, waiting another five years um, has a cost and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's a cost that you can't repay ever again. Um, but not to say that it's always worth the cost either, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and there you began to move away from Salesforce and actually start working on Airtable. Um, what was different about doing this company than your first? Yeah. I think a few things. I mean, one um, certainly, uh, you know, we had a lot more, um, you know, kind of patience, and uh, you know, as well as the the kind of luxury of, of having uh, now enough savings to kind of actually go about and and take our time in terms of laying the foundation of the company. And what I mean by that is really, uh, you know, spending a lot of time thinking about the the product and the market opportunity, um, doing a lot of kind of early days prototypes, user studies, talking to lots of people who had worked on similar companies in the space. Um, so we. We went out and in the early days of Airtable talked to anyone and everyone who had uh, been involved with like a database product, so uh, you know Microsoft Access or any of the kind of startups that were trying to do similar things. Um, you know, tried to to learn from uh, product leaders who had built productivity tools and, and kind of learn from from their experiences in doing that, um, and really just kind of tried to literally build kind of uh, what's no longer very common for startups, but you know the the equivalent of a business plan and, mm -hmm. and certainly a vision plan in terms of you know more coherently defining like here is the market opportunity here is a rough uh, you know kind of sizing of that market in terms of quantitative terms um, and then here's like kind of the the next five or six steps um, instead of just mm -hmm. the next two or three steps um, mm -hmm. in terms of execution so having a little bit more uh, of the luxury of, of kind of um, seeing ahead uh, more moves and, and really be able to predict um, you know, and, and foresee and, and lay the foundation for some of that execution down the road. I think analysis paralysis is a common phenomenon, especially among sort of up and coming founders. How did you know you had learned enough to start building? So uh, we took our sweet time. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, from start to uh, public launch, Airtable, I think was in incubation for around three years, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, and that, you know, I mean, considering that Etax had been founded, had raised money and, and kind of sold, uh, so its entire kind of short existence was literally within the span of like a third of the time that we spent mm -hmm. on Airtable uh, before even publicly launching. I mean, it, it was just a completely different time scale. So, um, you know, in the Airtable case, I think, uh, you know, I, I would say it's sort of the same calculus in both cases. They're, they're sort of competing, um, you know, sort of curves of both, you know, kind of uh, how do you actually want to build before you launch. And obviously, like, you can always launch with a more raw, mm -hmm. uh, half-baked product or half-baked business, um, you know, kind of strategy. Um, and, you know, and, and in some cases, that curve, I think, uh, may actually kind of have um, increasing returns on margin versus decreasing because, mm -hmm. like, if you can just get over a certain hump or threshold, and invest that extra six months, you actually end up with a non-linearly kind of better um, kind of uh, starting point. Um, and in some cases, you know, it'll level out. So I think a lot of it had to do with like kind of just having some intuition for, you know, you know, the, the definition of a minimum viable product um, is really dependent on like what that curve looks like and, you know, what is the point at which, you know, kind of you're no, no longer getting high returns on, on extra time that you're putting into building mm -hmm. that initial product. Yeah. 
Uh, and when Spark was released, did you, um, there's an old sort of saying, if you're not embarrassed by the thing that you launch, then you've waited too long. Yeah. Did, were there features that you still felt embarrassed by at that point, or was it uh, good, to ship, good to go at that point? Oh, I mean, we were extremely embarrassed by the V1 product. And, and truth be told, I, mean, I think Airtable is actually a great example of a product that uh, you know, had almost this infinitely long roadmap in terms of where our vision was for what it could be, and then you know, the actualities of, of what we had built at any given you know, kind of point in time, even after we had launched. So I think it, you know, it, was, um, it was a necessary uh, you know, kind of uh, embarrassment in that you know, we had to draw the line somewhere. We couldn't go and build this thing for 10 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously. Only three. Uh, surprisingly, I mean, uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, there, there's, um, I can't remember what video game, but there was some video game that just literally kept going on and on in development and mm -hmm. never launched for over a decade. Yeah. And they had piled tons of investment into it. And so, um, you know, for us, it, it just kind of felt like uh, even though, you know, part of us, you know, wanted to, to cry out and say, uh, we got to just kind of build this, this extra, you know, few things into it, um, there was just a, a hard line that eventually we had to draw. Obviously, um, at some point during that three year, time window, we ended up raising our initial seed round with mm -hmm. very, very patient investors, which is an important mm -hmm. quality um, for, for the type of company that we wanted to build. But even patient investors kind of have some limit of patience, right? I mean, just in terms of the the, the numerical returns that they're going to see, um, you know, on, on a company that takes like four years to, to launch versus, mm -hmm. you know, two. So um, I think there, you know, there was just a, a, a set of competing demands. And, um, you know, at some point, like, you know, we drew a fairly arbitrary, but um, um, you know, hopefully informed, uh, you know, decision on, on where we should draw that line. Yeah. I wonder how you set expectations with those investors for folks that might be, you know, doing something where they might be doing, maybe whether it's uh, biotech mm -hmm. or it's some sort of basic research or a project that might take a little bit longer to actually launch and hit scale. How might you get investors on board that are in it for the long game? Like yeah. That? Well, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's definitely a very explicit criteria that you can look for in, in finding a great investor uh, to partner with. So obviously, like, the first and, and uh, you know, kind of table stakes criteria is, like, do they want to invest in your company? Are they sure. excited enough? <laughs> um, but, you know, beyond that, then obviously, then you get to kind of apply your assessment of, of them and, and sort of create your own filters of, you know, uh, who are the investors that um, I want to choose to work with. And so I think um, making sure that your expectations are aligned, uh, you know, in terms of what the, the company's trajectory and, and mm -hmm. kind of time scale will look like. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I think that longer time scales are more tolerable when there's a clear, large kind of outcome um, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the road um, versus, you know, kind of a product where, you know, I think especially in kind of a lot of the viral consumer products out there, um, you know, nobody really knows if, if there is kind of a, uh, you know, hate to beat up on a, you know, uh, HQ, for instance, but like, you know, what, what is kind of the, the known market uh, opportunity there? Well, clearly there's something, but, you know, it's the traction itself that kind of validates the market mm -hmm. opportunity versus in an alternate scenario, you have a very, very clear conception of the market. Um, and then the, you know, kind of you've de-risked kind of the market outcome um, and, and shifted the risk towards execution mm -hmm. um, on a longer time scale. And so uh, I think that's just something that you, you kind of very, um, you know, kind of rationally and, and authentically convey to investors and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and hopefully uh, find one that, that kind of agrees with that thesis. Yeah. And now whether you're positioning it to investors or prospective clients, uh, I wonder how you decided to position Airtable versus an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets. Uh, it is generally a sort of appeals to all sort of product. Um, so how did you make that happen in the pitch? How did you position yourself? How did you size that market opportunity away from a Microsoft or a Google? Yeah, well, so for investors, um, you know, that, that was actually a really great litmus test of mm -hmm. whether, uh, you know, basically it was going to be an uphill battle or a downhill battle to get them to kind of uh, believe in and kind of see uh, the vision and kind of the, the opportunity we were going after. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, on the investor side, people either got it um, or they didn't. And in some cases, there were some sort of in-betweeners who we were able to kind of get excited about the vision and, and truly kind of buy into the kind of uh, the opportunity we believed in. On the customer side, um, I think you know it really came down to not just having a single killer feature, mm -hmm. um, but really having uh, you know kind of an array of different features that uh, you know kind of cumulatively added up to to create an overall product experience that was you know significantly better, 
not just marginally better than Excel mm -hmm. for a lot of use cases. So namely, I mean, I think um, Excel and, and Google Sheets and every other spreadsheet product out there today uh, lives kind of this dichotomous uh, life of, you know, on the one hand, trying to become, you know, the, the best possible number crunching tool, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to do any kind of like uh, numerical calculations, I mean, literally the, the origin of spreadsheets was, you know, for, for kind of accounting um, and doing financial projections and analysis. And so for that use case, um, Excel is excellent. Uh, I mean, it just has like so many decades of, you know, kind of functionality that's been built up around that. Um, and it's possibly the most powerful, you know, kind of tool you can possibly build for, for that use case. Um, but for a separate and, and arguably larger swath of use cases, um, Excel is actually used as a makeshift database. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically used to go and, and store lists of customers or projects or, or contacts. Um, and, uh, and for that use case, it's actually really, really not a, a great experience. It's a suboptimal one. I mean, um, you can't do basic things like attach files to uh, you know, a cell or to create different ways of kind of filtering um, that same list to show here this, here's the customers that are in LA versus SF and kind of store those as uh, separate views or to link different tables together as you could in a proper database. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of, you know, I think for us, it was pretty, uh, you know, there was a pretty clear pattern of use cases that fell into that ladder mold mm -hmm. that we could identify and say, look, we're not trying to be categorically better than Excel, um, but rather, you know, for this large class of use cases, we can be much better. But uh, you know, for, for the numerical use cases, we're we're not the right tool. You should use Excel. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually going out and acquiring clients, whether it's the individual who loves this thing mm -hmm. and then tries to champion it to the rest of the enterprise, or maybe you're doing enterprise sales the, um, from the top down. Um, how are you actually positioning the product in these early days before you have a bunch of templates already figured right. out, before you know what the use cases are going to be, before you have case studies that you can show people, hey, here's how BuzzFeed does right. it, so you should use it for your media business. Um, how are those early sales closed? Yeah, so we've never done top-down sales as to, you know, as in you know, getting a company that doesn't already have organic adoption of Airtable mm -hmm. um, and no prior interest in Airtable to basically buy and use our product. Mm -hmm. um, it's entirely bottoms-up driven. So, uh, you know, from, from conception to, to now, um, and, and now we, we do have a lot of enterprise Fortune 500 customers um, with sizable, uh, you know, kind of accounts with us, um, it's all been driven by, you know, kind of some uh, organic evangelists within the company kind of mm -hmm. picking up Airtable and then finding use cases, spreading that, and then hopefully, you know, uh, diversifying into multiple use cases across lots of teams. Mm -hmm. um, so to some extent, we didn't solve that problem, mm -hmm. but luckily we, we solved a different problem, which is how to get that kind of bottoms up uh, organic growth. Um, but I think in, in terms of value positioning, I mean, I think that's where having that early uh, front loaded research into the market mm -hmm. and, and doing a lot of early user studies really kind of, I mean, we weren't starting from zero when we launched the product. We had, um, you know, had, had had a lot of those conversations. Many of them were, were quite um, you know, kind of cynical, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, you go in and talk to an early user, uh, you know, uh, before your products launch and you kind of show them Airtable. <laughs> Um, and, you know, like uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, not everybody got it right away. And so um, I think it was sort of, uh, you know, a challenge of, of kind of figuring out from, from early on, like what of those, you know, multiple features that really differentiate us from Excel and make us better for this swath of use cases, do we want to emphasize in our messaging and our marketing and our you know, landing page? Um, and, and actually front loading a lot of effort around templates was critical. So mm -hmm. we launched with templates on day one because we knew we wanted to be um, somewhat suggestive in terms of here's some hints at different use mm -hmm. cases for Airtable. Of course, you can use it for other things, but um, you know, we don't want you to start out with a bank blank slate. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on how folks here might uh, at least prime themselves, if not their customers, to also be champions? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so there, there's a lot of tactical things and then a few very high level things. I mean, high level, I think one of the things that, that we really, uh, you know, pride ourselves on, on kind of doing right from day one and, and kind of reaping now increasingly the rewards of um, was creating a product experience that actually, A, was differentiated. So, mm -hmm. you know, we created something that, um, that wasn't uh, really available in any other tool um, and arguably still isn't to date. I mean, we were doing something very different from a lot of the, the project management tools out there. I mean, you know, products like Trello are really, really great, um, but not nearly as flexible and don't have that sort of spreadsheet, uh, you know, type of widespread applicability that Airtable did. So, you know, one, like actually fulfilling um, kind of the need that a lot of people had and, and wasn't otherwise fulfilled, I think it naturally gave us, um, you know, more, uh, you know, more customers that were inclined to, to sort of be excited and passionate mm -hmm. um, about our product and brand, namely because we were actually solving an 
unsolved problem for them and not just uh, trying to force yet another kind of project management tool down their throats, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think B, like, you know, uh, in, in terms of like the, the kind of more tactical things, I mean, today we have, uh, you know, a customer success team um, that is really, really fantastic at, you know, working with customers to, to kind of tease out, like, if there are existing evangelists, then, um, you know, kind of uh, seeing if they're interested in participating in like a case study mm -hmm. or, or even actively introducing Airtable to mm -hmm. other team members, um, you know, asking people for testimonials um, on, on various review sites, et cetera. And there's a lot of little things and, you know, certainly like um, doing things like MPS score uh, surveys and then like potentially segmenting kind of your uh, promoters and detractors and then kind of following up with each with, with kind of different, um, you know, kind of next steps. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of help um, double down on, um, you know, on the existing fan base you have and, and get them to promote it, uh, promote your product more. But it all has to kind of start from, you know, kind of a, a fundamental uh, need or an excitement uh, that you've created with, with your product. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so with that, you've gotten to at least some of the six steps you had in mm -hmm. mind with Airtable. Uh, and now you've re successfully raised over $50 million to go to the next few steps. Um, what uh, will the capital be used for primarily? What is it that you're going to be building next? And where does that line up with that sort of multi-step vision that you have? Yeah, well, I think um, you know we, we were in a very fortunate position when we raised our, our most recent round, which is to say that uh, we had really really strong uh, you know kind of uh, cash flow and and cash flow growth um, to the point where uh, you know theoretically we don't need to go and raise again, and we can just mm -hmm. kind of self fund the company using you know kind of the the investment from our customers really and mm -hmm. paying for our product, um, and and you know we happen to be in a business where uh, it's fairly high margin, for instance. Um, compared to something like Dropbox where there's actually more um, you know, operational cost of, of actually hosting all of the massive amounts of, of storage space for their product. Um, so I think that that's definitely uh, something that uh, we deemed very, very important from a fairly early uh, point was, you know, even if we did go out and raise uh, you know, additional venture funding um, and you know, had you know, kind of things to, to deploy that towards, we always wanted to have uh, you know, kind of uh, either um, you know, uh, visibility into or actually be at a state where, you know, we knew we wouldn't run out of money by yeah. default, right? So I think the challenge with raising um, venture, uh, you know, money in a lot of cases is that you're kind of putting yourself on this hamster wheel where you have to run faster and faster and then, um, you know, kind of you're, you're funding basically growth to the next step at which you have to raise another round as the only mechanism to kind of sustain that growth, mm -hmm. um, which you know works great if if you are a consumer product um, or or a product that you know has a, a clear uh, you know kind of convergent outcome for that that mm -hmm. that that's positive, um, but in a lot of cases I think can be um, sort of disastrous or, or force your hand in terms of making um, you know kind of short term uh, optimized decisions. So mm -hmm. you know for us a lot of it is just having you know a little bit more even um, of a you know kind of cash buffer to really think even longer term um, to certainly uh, you know, grow uh, more aggressively than we would have otherwise, um, but invest that money towards uh, you know, kind of building out um, the product team to kind of continue executing on our platform vision and our enterprise mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of product vision. Um, certainly to, to go out and uh, explore uh, you know, kind of uh, pushing into new verticals and use cases mm -hmm. um, with our go-to-market efforts. Yeah, and I remember one of the things that you guys wanted to build and will continue to build are the blocks, mm -hmm. right? Uh, kind of an interesting way for perhaps less technical people to truly use this product as a database. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us more about what blocks are? Yeah, so blocks are basically apps. You know, if Airtable is a uh, you know a database that anybody can use, so you can create mm -hmm. um, your own workflows. You know, let's say you're a, you're a major media company and you have uh, you know kind of a, a media outlet brand that that wants to create their content planning workflows in Airtable. You might create a database in Airtable for that purpose. Blocks are basically like apps that you can add on to that database to kind of give it very specific and powerful functionality. So, as a very concrete example. Um, you know, in that use case, you might have a block that uh, you know is basically a map view that allows you to visualize you know your content uh, on a map based on where it was filmed or, or you know what uh, the subject matter is. Um, but you might also have in the future kind of additional blocks, um, some of which will be built by us, and many of which will be built by an ecosystem of, of kind of mm -hmm. third-party partners, um, kind of like you know any app store, uh, where you could do even more powerful things like you know having the content that you uh, upload into Airtable 
automatically get sent out to uh, a machine vision service to transcribe what's in that video and actually enter it back into an Airtable record so that you can run a workflow around it. Or potentially um, you know, having something where you know, every time you go in and uh, you know, create uh, a new entry in let's say a restaurant's menu, uh, there's automatically like a print layout uh, optimized uh, you know, kind of menu that, that's formatted um, based on the content in your Airtable base. And that's just kind of pre-configured to automatically render out exactly what you want and you can print it um, or send it to uh, you know, professional printers, et cetera. So um, it's really about kind of building this, this platform where you know, because we're a very horizontal product, um, there's an enormous opportunity to, to basically allow people to, to build a really, really specific um, you know, kind of uh, purpose-built uh, applications mm -hmm. um, that really kind of uh, extend out and become like the full uh, solution that, that um, various teams and, and companies need for, for all of their uh, idiosyncratic use cases. Yeah, something we were talking about a little bit earlier was um, you know, this one product could you know, in some ways cannibalize a lot of developer work that needs to be done, right? And this is one of many products that is cannibalizing developer work. And it kind of seems like many of the technologies in Silicon Valley don't really need to be technical in some ways. There's so many tools now that allow uh, Joe Schmo like me to code something up using no code at all. And so I wonder if we're talking about sort of the more creative industries, the ways that type uh, that uh, your product will be used, um, if there are going to be, you know, generally as a, as a trend line that goes over a long period of time now, fewer needs for people in industries like media and the ones that are using your table to actually be technical at all. Sure. Is that part of the goal? It's a good question. Um, so the short answer is no. The longer answer is that uh, it's no, not because we have this sort of uh, you know arrogant belief that all entrepreneurship is is good for the world, and that mm -hmm. you know by creating a new platform, uh, mm -hmm. where by definition and you know categorically guaranteed to just create uh, you know net positive value for the world, mm -hmm. um, you know, but instead because uh, you know we think that very um, very specifically in our product and in the markets that we're going into and, and what we're seeing in terms of customer usage, um, we're actually enabling a lot of new use cases mm -hmm. to be built uh, that otherwise wouldn't have been built by a professional developer. So mm -hmm. a lot of times within Fortune 500s, for instance, when we get adopted, I mean, we're basically helping business end users kind of uh, you know, breathe new life into existing workflows or processes um, that otherwise would have just been this you know, perpetual kind of backlog item in, in kind of the IT department's uh, you know, kind of uh, list of, of things to do um, you know, because they don't have the resources to get around to it. So mm -hmm. a a lot of times, uh, you know, we believe that what we're doing is just kind of empowering a new form of, of creativity and, uh, you know, and, and basically, um, you know, productive output uh, from, you know, really any business end user to go and, and be the maker of their own software workflows, um, which has intrinsic benefits versus, you know, kind of outsourcing it to somebody else who will never understand your own needs, um, be able to iterate on that over time mm -hmm. as you would. So, um, and we've, we've seen both in, in kind of tech companies and larger companies, SMBs, et cetera, um, you know, I don't think we we've ever encountered firsthand, uh, you know, a case where you know we've literally cost uh, you know a developer their job or or taken something <laughs> um, you know un, uh, that they wanted on their plate off their plate. Yeah. Um, but in a lot of cases, uh, you know, it's you know basically enabling a new form of of kind of uh, a new class of of apps and, and software mm -hmm. to be built. Um, you know, we, we like to think of it as kind of equivalent, perhaps, to um, a lot of the uh, early kind of productivity suites built for personal computers. So mm -hmm. you know, kind of. Uh, GUI comes out and suddenly a whole new class of people can tap into the value of a personal computing in general. Um, but then also there's all of these kind of home productivity tools like you know, uh, graphics design tools or word processors, et cetera. And I don't think, um, you know, in, in the vast majority of those cases, I think you know, it's, it's not like uh, having you know, MS Paint on your Windows machine at home supplanted the need for graphics designers to exist mm -hmm. in the world. In fact, arguably right. that, that industry kind of grew massively during that same time. Um, and so you know, it's not because it's it's always universally the case, uh, but in our particular uh, you know kind of product offering and, and the way that you know we're kind of uh, bringing value to the market, we believe that you know we're actually creating you know net positive value. Yeah, it sounds like uh, really it uh, simplifies developer work that's already commoditized, and it moves developers up the value chains that actually do cool new original. For things. sure. 
Yeah. And I think one of the goals with our uh, with our platform offering is really to enable this kind of synergy between um, sort of uh, non-developers or non-coders. So we think that you know the term developers or, or creating software um, shouldn't be so uh, you know kind of intrinsically tied to the act of writing code. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's it's the you know it's it's something that anybody should be able to do in the same way that today anybody is able to use a computer um, without having to learn all the terminal-based commands, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so uh, you know really we we. See this kind of opportunity to kind of uh, both enable you know people who aren't coders today to kind of bridge that gap themselves and um, and through a very uh, you know kind of gradual set of abstractions be able to build more custom functionality into Airtable itself. So imagine things like uh, Visual Basic um, in kind of the MS Office world um, and be able to build kind of custom components that that kind of integrate seamlessly with you know kind of the, the GUI based uh, workflows you've created, mm -hmm. um, but then also be able to tie in uh, you know kind of the work of professional developers, professional coders to be able to come in and, and kind of build components and applications on top of Airtable as well. Mm -hmm. And something I want to pick out is um, something you said about the responsibility of sort of Silicon Valley, things that have changed here uh, in terms of sort of the world's uh, gaze on what Silicon Valley, San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area does. Um, I think there was definitely a time when uh, there was a general optimism that entrepreneurs were doing objectively good things for the most people. Uh, and I think that time is, uh, you know, RAP good times. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think that there's a bigger question around what the responsibility of founders, especially founders building bigger and bigger organizations, organizations that become in fact so big that they become political by nature. They yeah. affect cities. And I wonder how you think about your own responsibility as a founder to the people who are using and affected by your products. Yeah. Well, I think it's tough. You know, I think, uh, you know, the short answer is I think uh, every entrepreneur, um, does have a really, really important responsibility that uh, will not get reflected in kind of your, uh, you know, kind of your pitch deck to investors or, or based on kind of what conventional kind of Silicon Valley expectations for you know, startup success or growth are, but but really, um, you know, kind of need to be intrinsic um, to, you know, kind of to your value system and your beliefs and, and also kind of uh, contemplation around what your impact on the world is. And so I think there, there are, um, you know, it's a very imperfect market. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there are plenty of, uh, Companies, um, startups that that have uh, negative externalities, or or even if they're kind of um, you know kind of net positive on the world in an overall sense, um, you know they may involve a significant kind of wealth or or kind of. Um, you know, kind of success transfer from one part of the population to another. So in the case of like kind of displacing some pool of, uh, you know, of workers, um, you know, with a new technology that maybe enables a new class of, of workers to arise, but what does that do for, for kind of the original pool? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I do think that these are all really, really critical things that every entrepreneur thinks about. Um, you know, there, there's no, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, these things are often much harder to measure um, or even speculate about than, than just kind of the, the more visible metrics of you know how much revenue are you making and are you hitting the growth projections that you've set with your VCs or eventually you know kind of the public market investors mm -hmm. um, the only thing I, I think uh, we can do is just instill um, kind of a deep-rooted uh, respect for the importance of, of um, you know kind of all of the the impact that we create on the world and, and also just understanding that it requires constant scrutiny and as much mental effort um, to kind of think about that um, as all the other parts of running your company do and so mm -hmm. you know it's, it's one of those things that I think doesn't change unless you actually actively dedicate um, you know kind of effort and resources towards thinking about yeah, yeah. and so I want to begin priming us to think about any questions you might have we're gonna jump into that in just one minute um, just start thinking about that and then we'll have Judy run around with the mic uh, so if you have something you can kind of raise your hand catch your eye and we'll come to you in just a minute uh, and I figured uh, what we should sort of uh, wrap with is um, you know, we talked to the high level about how you're thinking about your, the impact of your company, but what are the explicit or implicit values of your company now? How do you sort of order the values? I know we talked about some of the nodes there. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's definitely a few, um, you know, kind of uh, important principles that stretch across the company as a whole. Um, but one of the things that uh, I've found, uh, you know, of, of greater, uh, greater and greater importance over time is also to have um, a lot of the principles of each specific thing that we do at our company. So whether it's how we think about hiring, um, 
recruiting, interviewing, uh, or you know, how we think about product planning or how we think about sales um, to really kind of codify the principles for each of those functions, which themselves are, are perhaps um, you know, kind of very closely related to the overall kind of company values. Um, but you know, I think among the, the values uh, of our company, just to, to share briefly, I, mean, I think uh, you know, one is kind of this, this belief in human empathy and, and human empowerment. So fundamentally, both in terms of our team and our employees, as well as our customers, um, and really the relationship we want to have with anyone in the world, whether they work for us or they, they are a customer of ours or they're you know, kind of a bystander, um, is one of, of really uh, you know, kind of believing in the, the deep potential of every human's kind of uh, abilities and, and creative potential. Um, and to be a product and, and company um, that really uh, tries to, to enrich people's experiences with, with technology mm -hmm. as opposed to replace people or, or to kind of coddle them even with, with kind of uh, you know, uh, increasingly narrow or simplistic experiences that assume like people are going to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. um I think internally that that often translates into uh, you know giving people a lot of uh, free reign and, and kind of autonomy in terms of making decisions and equipping people with the right framework and values, but not necessarily uh, trying to be really prescriptive about what each person is supposed to be doing at every single moment in time. Um, I think uh, you know a, a separate important um, value for us is uh, you know is one of diversity and inclusion, and I think that that cuts in a lot of different ways, and, and certainly we have uh, a lot of uh, progress to make on that in, in all fronts, but you know, certainly internally within our team, I think um, certainly you know, as we scale up, we want to make sure that as a company we, we are uh, you know, kind of reflecting uh, what I think are, are kind of our innate uh, you know, desires and, and intent to be a very inclusive environment. But there, there's um, all kinds of like kind of tactical, uh, you know, very specific things that you can do to address um, inclusion or, or kind of uh, potential lacks thereof. Mm -hmm. um, but also that means I think from a customer facing standpoint, um, we really want to emphasize just the, the broad range of people that we want to empower and enable with our company and our product. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we don't want to kind of frame our product as a very elitist tool that only like mm -hmm. you know, people <laughs> who are super savvy with technology um, and early adopters and Silicon Valley types are going to mm -hmm. be able to use. And um, even though, you know, uh, you know, that for some companies may be a fairly, uh, you know, kind of viable or lucrative path path to, to revenue and success. But mm -hmm. for us, it was actually really, really important early on to kind of uh, make our product and, and market our product uh, for everyone in the world and, and kind of uh, relishing um, you know, cattle farmers, for instance, using our product mm -hmm. as much as <laughs> nonprofits doing post-disaster relief, for instance, um, and organizing that in our table. So um, you know, I think there, there are a few other values that we have, but um, you know, from those bleed out kind of the, the specific uh, principles that I think are, are even more actionable. Yeah. For, for any given function. So you're saying there are cattle farmers using your table? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean honestly, uh, I've learned so much about so many different industries and, and role types and, and, uh, and companies just because we have uh, an incredibly heterogeneous cross-section of, of different types of customers. That's awesome. So with that, I want to hand it over to Derek with the first question. If you got a question, just uh, make sure to catch Judy's eye or my eye, and then we'll come over to you. Hey, so thank you yeah, uh, for thanks. speaking tonight. Uh, very informative. I come from a hardware manufacturing background, so the idea of software is very foreign to me. So when you're starting a software company, I'm sure many people here are, how does one go about obtaining users? I think that's probably one of the most challenging things that they're probably asking right now. Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I think in the early days of Airtable, and certainly in the days of eTact, <clears throat> You know, I remember actually asking, I felt embarrassed to go around and ask that question, even though it, it was like the top question on my mind, um, you know, of other, uh, you know, kind of companies or, or entrepreneurs who had been, you know, kind of gotten past that stage. And so, um, you know, honestly, I don't think there's, uh, I forget where this quote is from, but there's somewhere where somebody who, who said something like, you know, there, there's a lot of patterns of, you know, kind of growing from the one to 10 or like the 10 to 100 uh, mark. There's no pattern, like the zero to one is like, has to be different for every company. So, uh, I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, kind of the, the common adage that I think uh, y Combinator has espoused, which is, you know, like you basically sort of hack it, you know, like you, you do things that don't scale early on. And so um, I think, you know, uh, for us, like very, very early on before we even publicly launched, I mean, we spent a lot of time just literally going to people in our, you know, network, uh, you know, and, and basically showing them the product and trying to get them to use it live. And that obviously that, that doesn't scale, but 
Um, it was pretty invaluable in terms of getting, you know, kind of seeding at least the first few seeds of actual adoption, um, but also, you know, just kind of giving, getting that live firsthand feedback. Um, I think, uh, you know, certainly early on, like, you know, getting a couple kind of press spikes can be pretty uh, impactful, even if not sustainable forms of growth. Um, so, you know, like if you have a naturally viral product, which is to say, you know, either the, the product has built in virality through kind of a sharing mechanism or it's a product that, um, you know, will and, and can and will get talked about through word of mouth, um, then, you know, kind of the more you can fake it to or, you know, kind of hack it to get to like a, um, you know, a higher base starting point, um, the, the more you can just kind of let the, the natural effects of exponential growth mm -hmm. go from there. Um, in the alternate case where a product isn't naturally viral, which is totally fine and there are many successful companies um, that are not, I think, uh, you know, it's really about kind of figuring out what is the, the kind of sales model or the go-to-market model um, and, and can we create uh, an acquisition strategy that uh, eventually could be, uh, you know, kind of rational on a unit economic basis. So, uh, but, but initially, like, you may be perfectly, uh, you know, kind of uh, fine or even better off kind of going out and, and uh, you know, kind of sort of hacking, you know, out the first few customers. Mm -hmm. Cool. You have one back there? Hi. So I'm curious to know, when you go through your fundraising processes, do you have sort of a specific structure, uh, you know, within each round that you sort of go through, say, from all the way, you know, say, we need money up until you close it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how focused, uh, you know, on the process are you, you know, and, and how are you, like, able to, to differentiate from now I'm raising money to sure. now I'm also helping my product team, you know, go to market, whatever it might be. Yeah, so we've had kind of a non-traditional path in that regard in that uh, actually every single round we've raised has been, uh, you know, hasn't come through a formal fundraising process. So, you know, uh, in the case of our seed round, we we basically went out and wanted to have a um, just a, a very uh, accelerated process by, you know, only kind of going out and, and kind of talking to investors um, who already had some interest because they knew about us um, and or, you know, I had worked with in the past um, for the A rounds. Similarly, we had a lot of kind of preemptive interest and um, ended up uh, finding a great fit with uh, you know the, the firm CRB and, and our partner Max. Um, and uh, and then finally for our B round, uh, it was actually preempted by existing investors of ours. So we we also didn't go out and raise a, a, a you know kind of raise money in a process. Um, but I think, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, fundraising can be a huge distraction. And so uh, I think the, uh, you know, kind of the advice that, uh, you know, that, that I've heard and that I certainly, um, you know, sort of internalize in how I think about, you know, potentially future fundraising is, you know, to be uh, very clear, uh, clear minded about what is the, the kind of picture um, or projection you're trying to, uh, you know, kind of pitch to investors. So it could be we've figured out the product. Um, we don't have any revenue, you know, but uh, maybe if you're a SaaS business, you know, you're, you're saying uh, we have this product, we have engagement, but uh, the next step is to really monetize. Um, and then beyond that, you know, to monetize at a higher and higher rate and, and so on. Um, and then, you know, kind of backfilling sort of the, the metrics and saying like, you know, do we have the metrics today that support that story? Um, or, you know, if we feel like we push another month or two, uh, you know, onwards, will we get to the point where we might have the metrics that support that story? So um, I think actually, uh, you know, one of the, the best uh, fundraising decks and also, you know, kind of best startups I've seen uh, in recent times is, uh, is Front. And uh, Matilde, the, the founder of that uh, company, was, was uh, kind enough to actually open source her A round and B round decks. Um, and I think, uh, I don't think I've seen another deck that uh, is as good and, and sells as, as compelling a vision of what they've figured out to that point and then what is to be figured out beyond there. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, does this work? Yeah, please. Oh. Uh, my name is Raja Weiss. Uh, I'm the founder of Spot Idol. It's a platform for idols and people to grow and profit. Um, my question, I actually have two questions. So what's the story for your first hires? And then um, what would be the three most important things that you would uh, say about hiring? Yeah. Um, so at Airtable, I mean, technically, if you include 
uh, you know, the the co-founding team, which was you know kind of uh, myself and, and two other people, our, our uh, chief product officer Andrew and, and uh, our CTO Emmett. Um, you know, so the, the three of us had kind of known each other for probably the better part of a decade, maybe actually even more than a decade at that point. Um, but uh, so th there was kind of a prior. Um, you know, in terms of building out that original founding team, uh, there was prior context. Um, I think after that, um, the first handful of people that we hired were still in network. So very much people that um, you know either one of us had worked with before um, and and kind of uh, knew would would kind of be able to work on and and solve a lot of the problems that we had as a as a product and, and as a company. Um, I think uh, beyond that, I mean, we we really um, from then on till now, and even going forward, I think like we've basically um, you know cast the net far and wide, and, and I think um, you know uh, we've tried to to sort of uh, be open to to as many kind of different uh, kind of recruiting opportunities and, and kind of platforms as possible. Um, you know, part of which is obviously great for kind of including in increasing kind of the overall uh, you know diversity of your network, but then also part of which is just a very pragmatic desire to like not compete against every other company in the very, very limited set of like, you know, kind of uh, prospects or, or, you know, kind of platforms that everybody else uses. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, so we, we've used uh, in particular, like a lot of the different um, recruiting platforms, I think, um, Underdog, Hired, uh, Angel List, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, we've done some like just random, like, you know, finding people uh, because they tweeted about us and then looking them up and then like reaching out to them. Um, so, I mean, we've literally gotten hires from, from various, you know, in, including some of the sources. So I think, um, you know, uh, I think we were just, uh, we were and, and will continue to be very kind of scrappy and, and kind of uh, try a lot of different things. Um, you know, it, it is kind of a competitive market today. And so I think by definition, to succeed uh, really, uh, you know, to really succeed in, in terms of recruiting and, and hiring kind of those first few people, I think you have to sort of uh, not just do the, the things that everybody else is doing. Cool. Do we have any other questions? I think we had one. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Sure. My name's Lee. I have a question about, actually, similar question. So, about um, how you found your co founder uh, for your, you know, two companies yeah. that you had. And also, uh, what advice do you have uh, for, you know, um, new startup founders in terms of how they should, you know, find the best um, partner or founder? Yeah. Uh, what skill sets does it have to kind of complement what you don't have? Or, um, do you look into their long-term vision or, you know, right. um, is it aligned or not? Yeah, well, I think all of the above. Um, so I think uh, definitely having long-term alignment as well as also making sure that you have the complementary skill sets and expectations to be able to get the company to the steps two, three, and four that will get you to that bigger vision um, are both, you know, table stakes. Uh, I think, um, you know, I, I think the uh, the tricky thing about um, co-founders is, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, it, it is tough to to find a co-founding relationship if you don't have a lot of prior context on on that person's abilities and interests, et cetera. So, you know, if you're kind of going in this kind of uh, accelerated search process to to find somebody, it can be really tough to to make such a big decision and vet out all of those dimensions in a very finite amount of time, um, and so. You know, I think um, the you know if, if there's not um, you know already uh, an opportunity to kind of uh, go and, and look through your existing network and, and sort of people that you have some prior context on, um, you know, I, I would say that you know going in and looking at kind of uh, new people uh, who you don't have a lot of that context on as, as potential co-founders, like would just emphasize like definitely um, really think through not just the steps one, two, but like also you know kind of the the longer term mm -hmm. expectations. So like. What do they want their role to be versus versus yours in five years from now? If you're 200 people or 500 people, and I think um, you know it can be really challenging. And I certainly didn't do this in in uh, the e-tax days uh, because it feels like so much of a stretch and just so contrived to like speculate as to what your roles will be. It almost feels like kind of uh, overly arrogant to kind of like think about what your roles will be when you're a 500 person company if you're literally just two people and you haven't even built an additional product yet. Um, but I think it is important and it's sort of, you know, it's what ensures that you're not setting yourself up for kind of short-term success but kind of long-term failure or, or local maxima in terms of that, that co-founding team. And um, yeah, I think uh, just, you know, having that conversation in earnest, um, you know, kind of earlier on in the process is, is super valuable. Cool, we'll finish with our last one tonight. 
Um, hey, Howie. Uh, so you spoke earlier a little bit about kind of bottom-up growth, particularly for your sales channel. So having organic users and then targeting those companies. Mm -hmm. um, wondering if you can speak a little bit more and, and kind of give us a bit more depth on, on what that looks like and, and what you've been able to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's actually fairly straightforward in that, um, you know, for better or for worse, we didn't necessarily do a whole lot to engineer that uh, explicitly other than, you know, A, building a product that was inherently collaborative from day one. So, you know, the nature of Airtable is that it was built to be a great collaborative experience from day one. So, you know, it was, uh, for instance, we, we invested a lot of time up front into building a real-time uh, kind of database engine that gives you that sort of Google Docs real-time collaborative experience. Uh, but in the, the kind of contract of, of a relational database with all of the extra functionality that Airtable has. So um, we, we very much kind of uh, invested in making um, the product collaborative from day one and building in a lot of the sharing features and trying to reduce the friction there. And so, you know, if you want to share Airtable with somebody, hopefully um, it's, you know, fairly effortless and, and there's not too many extra steps or clicks that you have to go through to do that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think really it, it goes back to kind of the fundamentals of, you know, there's probably a lot more that we could optimize in terms of like the growth funnel and like kind of the viral loop. And, and we frankly haven't spent a lot of energy or time focusing on that or, or kind of growth hacking in, in kind of that, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the same sense that some consumer viral companies do. Um, but really, I think we've just kind of benefited from the fact that Airtable solves a problem that people care about enough to actually go out of their way to talk about. It. And so, like, I mean, if you go onto Twitter and just search for Airtable, um, generally speaking, I mean, there's a, there's a fair cadence of organic and, and very positive tweets where, you know, uh, and in some cases, like, people are so enthusiastic that they'll say, like, you know, I never talk about products that I use. Like, I'm not that person, but I, you know, Airtable is the one product I want to talk about. Or, like, you know, my uh, my partner told me I need to stop talking about Airtable over dinner because I'm, like, too obsessed with it or something. So I think, like, to break out of the, the kind of um, headspace of just being a product that solves a, a utilitarian problem marginally better than some other product, mm -hmm. but actually to enter into this like emotional territory of your mind where like you care about it so much, and maybe part of that is like the brand and the UX as well, kind of being a delightful, um, you know, kind of playful product experience in some sense. Um, obviously, Slack I think um, in recent times has been held up as an exemplar of, of doing that really well, but I think a lot of it just comes down to having enough emotional appeal. Um, to actually kind of get people to, to go out of their way to share it. And, you know, a lot of that sharing occurs offline in ways that you can't engineer in terms of like in-product functionality or, or kind of viral loops. So, um, yeah, I wish I had more uh, to, sh to, to kind of explicitly share there or, or to that, that we had done. But uh, the reality is like, um, we, we really haven't done a lot of proactive work to, to engineer more sharing um, or bottoms up virality. Yeah, I think building a viral B2B product, not an easy one. Yeah, I mean, I think you can definitely remove like a lot of the, I mean, the, the biggest thing is just like removing friction. So like yeah. the obvious friction, like if it's really arcane, you know, to go at and, and figure out how to share, um, share the product. Or for instance, like if the product can't technically scale to like more than five collaborators, then of course, like those are easy, low hanging fruit to kind of like, um, you know, kind of whittle away. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's, it's that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here, but uh, you stick around for a little bit longer? Yeah, sure. Sweet. Well, with that, please give Howie a round of applause. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sweet, sweet. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely.